Greetings, everyone, and welcome to R. Kelly Appeal TV. I'm so grateful for those who are regularly tuning into the channel, those who comment and give hope to the channel from both my course study and from this YouTube platform. When you come to R. Kelly Appeal TV, I want you to know that the information is going to be 100% accurate. In researching the law schools around the country, many of my focal points come from places such as Harvard Law School Review, Akron School of Law, and the Johnny Cochran Law Firm. God, this would be an awesome day if we were to have had Attorney Cochran to defend Robert Sylvester Kelly. Today, I have an excerpt from the University of Chicago Federalist Society. The society is founded on the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. American um, Constitutional Society, um, that is another place we're going to be looking at today. This society fosters public programming, publications, digital presence, general information. It generates information, shape policy debates, and its issues include access to courts, voting, equality, immigration, workers' rights, and more. Now, in this conversation, there are going to be three judges, Supreme Court Justice Balmer, specifically District Court Judge Ann Donnelly. I want you to take a listen to how the judges think. Uh, oh, and Judge Ho. I want you to take a listen to how the judges think on individual cases and caseloads in general. Your views are welcomed and very appreciated. So here we go. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ed Mateen. I'm one of the programming directors here at the University of Chicago Federalist Society. I'd like to welcome you all to today's event, a conversation with Justice Bomber, Judge Ho, and Judge Donnelly. Our panel today features the final round judges for the 2021-2022 Hinton Moot Court competition. I'd like to start by introducing our distinguished panel. First, the Honorable Judge James Ho. Judge Ho was appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit by President Donald Trump in 2018. He earned his B.A. in Public Policy from Stanford University and is an alumnus of the University of Chicago Law School. Before his appointment, he was co-chair of the National Appellate and Constitutional Law Practice Group of Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher. Judge Ho has served in all three branches of the federal government. On the Senate Judiciary Committee, he served as chief counsel for the subcommittees on the Constitution and Immigration under Senator John Cornyn. The Justice Department, he served as special assistant to the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights and as an attorney advisor at the Office of Legal Counsel. He clerked for Justice Clarence Thomas of the U.S. Supreme Court and for Judge Cherry E. Smith of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. He has also served as an adjunct professor of law at the University of Texas School of Law. And now, on to the Honorable Judge Ann Donnelly. Judge Donnelly was appointed to the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of New York by President Barack Obama in 2015. She received her B.A. from the University of Michigan in 1981 and graduated from The Ohio State University Moritz School of Law in 1984. Prior to her appointment, Judge Donnelly served as a prosecutor in the New York County District Attorney's Office for 25 years, where she held positions of Senior Trial Counsel and Chief of the Family Violence and Child Abuse Bureau. From, 20, from 2009 to 2015, she served as a judge on the New York Court of Claims. At the same time, Judge Donnelly served at various points on the New York Supreme Court in Bronx County, in Kings County, in New York County, as well as on a special term for election matters. And now I'll pass it on to Ariel Yash. 
introduce you. Uh, my name is Ariel Ayash, and I am the pre uh, co-president of the University of Chicago chapter of the American Constitution Society. It is my uh, honor to introduce the Honorable Thomas A. Balmer. Justice Balmer is an Associate Justice for the Oregon Supreme Court. He is formerly uh, Oregon's 43rd Chief Justice and has served from May 1st, 2012 until June 30th, 2018. He was first appointed to the Supreme Court in 2001 and was re-elected in 2002 and re-elected again in 2008 and 2014. Justice Balmer received his AB from Oberlin College and is an alumnus of the University of Chicago Law School. Prior to serving as a state justice, he was Deputy Attorney General of Oregon from 1993 to 1997, and he practiced with the Portland law firm Adder Wynn and its predecessor firm Lindsay Hart, Neal, and Wiegler from 1982 to 1993 and from 1997 to 2001, and served as a managing partner. Earlier in his career, he was an associate with Wald, Harkratter, and Ross in Washington, D.C., a trial attorney with the Antitrust Division at the U.S. Department of Justice, an associate with the Boston firm Cho Holland Stewart, and in addition has taught as an adjunct professor at, of law at Lewis and Clark Law School and an adjunct prof professor of political science at Lewis and Clark College. Um, with that, uh, I would like to pass it off to Professor Mazur, who will be moderating this talk today between the judges. Um, professor Mazur needs no introduction and will take it away. Great. Um, thank you very much, Ed and Ariel. Um, and thank you so much to Justice Balmer, Judge Ho, and Judge Donnelly for joining us both for this lunch and then for uh, the actual judging of the moot court to take place later this afternoon. And especially thank you very much to Judge Donnelly for stepping in uh, at a very late hour to replace uh, a cancellation that we have. We really appreciate you being here. Um, I'll, I'll just note very quickly, we're going to save time for Q&A at the end. Um, uh, especially for the students. You're welcome, of course, to raise your Zoom hands when the moment comes, but also if you'd like to send me a question via chat anytime before then, that's perfectly fine as well, and I can read those off of the chat uh, when the moment comes. So I, I thought we would start by um, uh, hearing from uh, from our jurists a, a little bit about sort of their career and path to the bench um, and sort of what, what brought them uh, to their, their careers on the bench. And in particular, I think um, it would be interesting to know what, if anything, they found especially challenging about making the transition from practice to, uh, to judging. Um, and what, if anything, they know now about being a judge that they wish they had known uh, back when they began, um, uh, that they wish they could have told their, their earlier selves? So, um, Justice Palmer, maybe we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, well, greetings, students. It's great to be with you. Um, I was uh, in Chicago you know, during three Aprils when it snowed. I'm sure it must have snowed. It snowed every day when I was in law school uh, at the University of Chicago. Uh, but uh, my my path, I'm rich in Oregon. I went to college and law school in the Midwest, practiced on the East Coast. Uh, and then at age 30, I got smart and returned to Oregon uh, and practiced uh, with, uh, with with firms, uh, with a firm there, and then with, worked at the uh, Oregon Justice Department uh, and, uh, and then back to the firm and then was appointed to the Supreme Court. Uh, I, I think that what I wish I could have done uh, about in terms of being a judge is I would have loved to have been a trial judge uh, for a few years if I had known that I could then leave that and go to an appellate court. Um, I like the appellate court work. I like the, I mean, it's sort of like, in, in some ways, it's uh, you know, like writing a, you know, a, a paper all the time, writing a 20 page paper on search and seizure, you know, when there's an inventory search of a car that was stopped for a traffic infraction, can you uh, look in the containers? And then, oh, and here's a, here's a civil case. Here's an interesting uh, derivative, shareholder derivative case. You write a 30-page paper on that. Uh, it is a being on an appellate court is a little uh, uh, removed from the practice of law, but you're still involved. That's why I like this better than, for example, being a law professor. Uh, but uh, I... You know, in terms of advice for people who want to be judges, I think you should first need to be a really good lawyer. You need to be as good a lawyer as you can. There are things you can learn from everybody that you see, everybody you work with. You can pick things up. Uh, and I don't think I, I don't think I started out wanting to be a judge, but after a while, you see judges doing their work. You think, 
gosh, that's something that I think I could do reasonably well. And it's something I think I would like doing. And maybe at about the same time in your career, people start to say, oh, maybe this person would be a DC judge. So I think look forward to the opportunities uh, in private practice. You know, if there are judgeships, go for it. And uh, sometimes it works out. A lot of times it doesn't. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, Judge Hope. First of all, I am uh, beyond delighted to be back uh, with my alma mater, albeit in this honestly very strange uh, format. I honestly, I, I don't think there's anything that can replace in-person uh, dialogue and conversation, and so I regret that we're not doing that. But surely this is better than nothing, and so I am profoundly honored to be part of this, I assume, first ever virtual moot court of, of Chicago. Uh, uh, I think the, the I'm trying to remember the questions, uh, there, are, there are many questions, but uh, in terms of the, the career, I wanted to actually very strongly reinforce and echo what Justice Ballmer just said. Uh, if I heard correctly, it was sort of starting your career, doing some very exciting things in, in our nation's capital, but then going home. Um, I, I, I did sort of the same. Uh, Texas actually technically wasn't home. Uh, I grew up in California, uh, but ended up going back to Texas, which is my bride's home. And uh, I, I think that uh, uh, I totally agree with 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 Justice Ballmer that you know, DC is. You know, I don't. I assume I don't need to tell this crowd of young, uh, ambitious, uh, enthusiastic law students. You know, Washington DC is is hard to beat right. as a destination for uh, those who are publicly spirited, excited about the law, excited about the challenges that the legal profession brings, as well as being an, obviously the, the heart of the nation's political system. Uh, so in no way would I discourage anybody from going to D.C. for at least a little bit, if that's something that you want. Uh, that being said, D.C. is honestly uh, has its pros and I'll just say has its cons. And there was no world in which I wanted to spend the rest of my life in D.C. And so and I didn't really want to go back to California. So when I uh, was engaged to my now wife, Allison, I was just you know excited, obviously, to be married to her. But, but excited, frankly, to, to have a home state that I was excited to, cl to, to claim as my home state. I've uh, been back in Texas uh, for 15 years, and honestly, taking the experiences uh, and whatever skills I learned in D.C. and getting to bring it home to a practice in Texas, I felt like I had uh, a very uh, interesting uh, set of opportunities in the law here in Texas, uh, uh, and, and, I got to, and I got to live here. Um, and so... Uh, I, I share that path with Justice Palmer. Uh now, as you can hear, we are looking at judges from different locations. Texas is stated to have the strictest laws in America for some, for some of us. Chicago is showing us how its judges do what they do. But the question I have for you is should laws be the same across the nation or should they be based on individual case? Let's keep listening. Um, in terms of transitioning or you know, what I learned uh, being a you know, still relatively young judge, I've only been here now about three and a half years. Um, you know, I had always understood in theory as a litigator, both in private practice and in government, that you know, judges are generally hardworking. They're they're devoted to their craft, but they're just very very busy people. There are a lot of cases on their docket, and you know, when you're in practice, whether in government or, or private, you've got whatever handful of cases you're you're handling. Um, but whatever you're doing, however busy you might think, there it just pales in comparison in terms of the numerosity of cases on your docket. And so you should be prepared to to, to litigate that way. To, to you know, there's just no world in which your judge, no matter how devoted they are to their job and then judges my experience has been judges are by and large very devoted very hard working uh and doesn't matter how interesting your case is they're not going to be able to spend anywhere near the amount of time getting ready and learning every nook and cranny of the case law or the record as 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 you do and so in a way the job of a litigator uh, of an advocate is part teacher as well as part advocate and of course being a teacher you have to be a credible teacher knowing how to present your case to a panel or to an individual judge uh, in a way that seems and is fair, while at the same time understanding that you're obviously engineering for an outcome that, that is favorable to your client. 
and, and striking that balance. Anyway, I say all that to say that, you know, becoming a judge uh, has reinforced that principle uh, in, in the mo- about, the, uh, about the most intense way possible. If I, if I was asked, you know, what's my biggest frustration being a judge, it's honestly the inability to spend anywhere near as much time on each case as I used to be in any number of my previous positions. And frankly, even being a law clerk really doesn't give you a full picture. It gives you a good picture, to be clear. But, you know, on our court, you get four law clerks. And so each clerk only sees, at, you know, at most, uh, in, at least in a sort of robust way, one-fourth of the docket. And, and to be clear, it's actually much less than one-fourth because there's a lot of stuff that judges do that we never even give to the clerks. And so a law clerk, you get a picture of what it's like to manage multiple cases and not just to be, you know, learning about them, but actually be casting a vote. Uh, and, and, and putting your name to a position. Um, but but even as a law clerk, like I said, you're not you're really just seeing one slice of it. I, I, sh- I should know, I actually have meant to look at the statistics, try to figure out how many cases we have to decide and how much period of time. But my bet is it, it would be shocking to most people. Uh, and I, I can only imagine on intermediate state appellate courts and state trial courts that the numbers are much worse. They really just have to, you know, just get through and you're almost like a conveyor belt. And that's uh, something for every advocate, no matter what position you hold in, in the legal system. So people who find themselves in the system of justice in America, according to a just Supreme Court justice, is stating that they are basically looked at as items on a conveyor belt. Their cases um, are looked at as items being on a conveyor belt. These judges have to make legal considerations and decisions such as sentencing that could remove a person from society for a lifetime based on a 15-minute overview of an entire life scenario of this individual, of this defendant. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, to always take account of. Great, thank you, uh, Judge Donnelly. Well, um, I guess I'm in the in the sausage factory aspect of the um, of the judicial system as a trial judge. Can anyone please tell me what Judge Donnelly meant by being in a sausage factory um, of the trial court system? What do you think she meant by that? That sounds really strange. First of all, I'm so happy to be included in today's event. Such an interesting topic. I always learn something uh, from from doing moot courts like this. So um, I'm from the Midwest, and I went to New York, and I never came back. So, so I've, I've been in New York now for more than 35 years, almost 40 years, um, and um, I was a prosecutor for about 25 years uh, as an appellate lawyer starting out and then as a, as a trial lawyer um, for a good portion of that. Um, I, I don't remember what all the questions were, but I'm going to try to do my best. I'd say the biggest, I think one of the questions was, what's the transition from going from being an advocate to being uh, a judge? And I would say that the most important quality, which would probably serve you well as a lawyer too, is just being able to listen um, and, um, uh, you know, obviously be, be a good lawyer. But I, I find that I talk a lot less um, as a judge than I did as a trial lawyer. Um, and that's because I, as Judge Ho said, I, re- I rely on lawyers to um, – give me the foundation for the case, whether it's a factual foundation or a legal, uh, uh, a legal foundation. And then um, we do have just a, what could be characterized as a crushing caseload, I would say. Having been in state court, um, sometimes those caseloads are even worse. Uh, but we have a, you know, a full complement of civil and criminal cases. And just one other thing that I've learned is that every case is important to someone. There's no case that is 
unimportant. And I, I, I recall that as a state court judge, if I would handle misdemeanor cases, you know, sometimes people think they're not such, such important cases, but they are. And so I'm, I try to keep that in mind that for litigants uh, and for lawyers, um, these cases are all very important. Um, and then the other thing that I try to keep in mind is that having been a courtroom lawyer for such a long time, I have vivid recollections of being yelled at by judges. Uh, I, I think that happened more in the 80s and the 90s than it does now. I'm, I'm not positive. Uh, but I do remember that it didn't feel very good to be, you know, to be yelled at or, or, or embarrassed in court. And so I do try to remember what it's like to be a litigant and how much how much work you have to do to prepare uh, for your cases. So I hope I hope I'm not mean to anybody, but you know, um, uh, just trying to remember uh, how it felt to be to be an advocate. Um, that's great. Thank you. I want to pick up on the very last thing you said, uh, Judge Donnelly, and ask a question that's maybe of particular relevance to the four students who will be arguing later today, um, which is, what are the things that uh, attorney, that advocates do in front of you that you think are particularly effective or particularly ineffective? What makes for an especially good or bad uh, advocate in your court? Uh, Judge Donnelly, do you want to start us off? Sure. Well, one thing that I always tell people is that there are a thousand roads to God. There are a thousand roads to be, uh, a thousand ways to be a good lawyer. So it's not always being the most flashy person in the room, but the critical tools that you can bring to your job as an advocate are preparation for your case, which always shows, and being straightforward with the judge or with the jury about what the record is, um, and um, making your case persuasively. Um, you know, I've sat on the Second Circuit a few times as a as a visiting judge, and I'm always most impressed by people that speak plainly, uh, but have a thorough knowledge of the record. Having a thorough knowledge of the record is very important, and I do agree with Judge Ann Donnelly on that. Attorney Bon Jean could not have been clearer when she stated in her briefs about Robert Sylvester Kelly and the reasons behind the, the respectful way that she spoke. And so I want to ask you this question. Do you feel Judge Donnelly has learned to listen to the arguments of a case regarding Robert Sylvester Kelly Yes, listening is extremely important to the facts when it has to do with putting someone in a state of a life sentence. However, it is another thing when that opportunity allows a judge to overstep boundaries in this case. So what are your thoughts? What are your feelings? One other thing that I don't find particularly helpful um, I really don't like it when people are, when lawyers, um, I don't know if fight is the right word, but sometimes people can, people feel very passionate about their position and sometimes they don't treat each other very well. I find that uh, not helpful. You know, uh, in, in written submissions, when things are underlined or in all caps or, you know, somebody using the word outrageous. So, I mean, I, I sometimes think, you have to just remember that the judge always doesn't always doesn't always want to hear that. Um, but uh, um, I would say the number one thing is being prepared, uh, just knowing the record of your case, knowing the case law um, is the most important um, quality that you can bring to an effective argument or trial. Thank you, um, Justice Bowler. No, I, I, I agree with all all that. I think that the in an appellate court, I mean, there are differences between arguing in a, in a trial court and an appellate court uh, and between arguing in an intermediate appellate court and the U.S. Supreme Court or a state Supreme Court. You know, when you're in the trial court, you know, you're saying, look, my case, this case is like this case just decided by the New York Court of Appeals or just decided by the Second Circuit. Uh, and so it's, it's in, within this line of cases, not that line. 
when you're before, uh, and similarly in an intermediate court of appeals, this is what, like this line of Supreme Court cases, and here's why. Uh, when you're in a court of last resort, we're trying to figure out what should the rule be. Uh, and the, uh, uh, and you can't, you're not going to get away by saying, oh, this is like your other cases, and but not at all like these cases that you, your court decided. If it was like that, we wouldn't have taken the case, wouldn't have allowed review. Uh, we took it because it's, it's going to give us an opportunity to uh, articulate a, an important rule for the lower appellate court and the trial courts. Um, so think about particularly if you're in an appellate court or a court of last res and a court of last resort in particular, uh, you know, what's the limiting principle? What's the rule of law you really want this want to come out of this case? It's not just as you are in trial court, just trying to get the ruling in your favor. <clears throat> Think about that. Uh, certainly no ad hominem attacks, no statements about what an idiot the trial court was or uh, how awful the opposing counsel is. No jury uh, issues. Don't tell me how bad the injury was that we're here to we're here in an appellate court because there's a legal question. And I want the uh, I want you to help me for you and your client figure out what the correct answer to this legal question is. It's a discussion. OK, terrific. Thank you very much. Um, Judge Ho. So I want to pick up on a, a theme that I think Judge Donnelly opened with, which is that uh, seeing lawyers bicker and what Justice Palmer said about you know insults towards anybody uh, uh, is you know one of the worst things you see as a judge. Uh, hopefully, you don't see many insults in the courtroom, but you do see quite a bit of fighting and and bickering. And I, I think it sort of misunderstands how the litigation process is supposed to work, even though it's actually quite common for lawyers. And it certainly misunderstands the appellate process. And I think of the appellate process uh, in particular, but I, I would think lawyering generally as uh, one that you should view primarily as an intellectual exercise, uh, at least in front of the, the, the judge. I'm not a jury. I, I've never done a jury trial or anything like that, so I'll let others speak to how to handle juries. How does an intellectual trial work for defendants who cannot understand the jargon that is spoken and they have to participate with their attorneys in their life situation? What's going to happen to them? So if they can't understand it because of dyslexia, because of, a, of a, a mental disability that is known to be a mental disability in the United States of America, and who may be under stress and who cannot understand the words coming forth from their case to defend themselves, how does an intellectual trial work? Okay, was this case behind Robert Sylvester Kelly firing the incompetent judges that were working against him earlier in the litigation. I mean, could that have been the reason? Because if I can understand you, how can I help you defend me? Um, and this is a problem in America. What's your thoughts? But certainly from a judge's perspective, it's an intellectual process. And so I think advocates are better off uh, when they view it as an intellectual process as well. And, and towards that end, um, being intellectually honest. You know, everybody understands that you're there wanting a certain result. Nobody will be confused by that. Uh, given that, uh, ma making sure that you are always candid, making sure that you maintain your credibility at all times. Uh, we understand that you're pushing for a particular position. Um, but if you ever overstate something, whether it's you know saying that a case says X when it doesn't quite say X, uh, saying that the record proves Y when in fact it doesn't, uh, those are not good moments. Uh, and those are moments that I certainly remember when a lawyer has told me something and either in that moment or later on, uh, I find out that, that turns out to be not true. Uh, it's not just that you've lost credibility on that moment, it's that you've really lost credibility uh, across the board. Um, the uh, One of my dear friends is actually one of the advocates in that case that we're going to moody, be mooting today, Mark Perry uh, at Gibson Dunn used to tell us uh, uh, sort of uh, as 
rising appellate associates, we can't trust you to get the commas right. We can't trust you to get the law right. And I always took that very much to heart that uh, both as an associate, you know, just doing a good job site checking and whatnot, but also as an, as an advocate talking to judges, um, you know, never, ever, ever uh, destroy your credibility because uh, you can build a lifetime of, of, of good work and reputation and destroy it in a moment uh, by overstating. Um, uh, and then the last thing I would say, you know, absolutely, it's all, it's all about preparation. One, one specific aspect I'll, I'll note is, particularly when you're at the appellate phase, understanding that there's multiple ways to look at a case. Uh, so I always would tell, you know, when I, when I had to move a case uh, in practice, I would always have a moment, you know, halfway or so through the process, I would ask everybody, okay, if we could change sides right now, obviously you're not allowed to do that, but if you could, hypothetically, uh, would you do it? Would you want to, to switch sides and why? That inevitably created uh, interesting dialogue and allowed us to probe our case in yet another way. So certainly trying to understand exactly why the other side has good points and really trying to appreciate why their, their position is not as crazy as you might want people to think uh, and really get in under the, uh, under the hood on that. Uh, but also not just switching sides, but also understanding that your judges who are not obviously on any side, they're just trying to decide what the law is, uh, that judges have different views. Uh, so understanding originalism, understanding textualism, understanding uh, the, the role of precedent, understanding that people do care, even the most hardcore originalists at least wonder what the, what the, what the uh, practical consequences. And so being able to understand a case and all the various aspects of it through every possible lens. You know, if you're relying heavily on precedent, that's great. But you better have a reason why the precedent is correct or fair or good for country good for the society, or at least good textualism or good originalism. Having all those things nailed down in every possible way, uh, that way, uh, hopefully, you're, if you're prepared enough, there's, there's no, no question that you will not expect. Both sides of a criminal practice has an ulterior motive. Um, the prosecution is trying to win. The defense is trying to win. And everything that's being brought to the judge has to go through the judge. So the judge has to be fair and impartial to what's going on. Listening, as Judge Donnelly put it in this conversation, listening. What are your thoughts on getting the facts right when we see the information has not been presented fairly? When information has been tainted based on an ulterior motive of, say, prosecution to defense, it becomes a mudslinging battle that happens in the on the court, like a basketball court. But yet behind the scenes in the chambers, everyone's playing golf, going to the cigar clubs, going to the secret society meetings, and they're together. How can you really and truly defend someone 100% with your heart, mind, and soul if you're partying with the same individuals that's trying to bring that individual down. So this system needs a definite, um, I think the Joker said it best on Batman, this town needs an enema. This criminal justice system needs a flushing out and a recreation because this has been wrong. This has been wrong. These, these, these ways that things have been done and we see it in Robert Sylvester Kelly's case. We see it. So what are your thoughts? Great, thank you very much. Um, I guess I'd like to ask now about sort of um, parts of your docket, the types of cases that arise in front of you. And I'm curious um, whether there are particular parts of the docket, maybe particular subject matter areas of cases or types of cases that you find particularly difficult or challenging in some regard, or, or parts of the docket, maybe it's the same, uh, that you find especially interesting or especially rewarding in some regard. Certain types of cases that you, you know, have uh, particularly strong feelings towards, um, given the different types of dockets that I assume your courts experience. So uh, Judge Ho, maybe you could start us off uh, with this one, please. Sure, that's a great question. Uh, one of the both benefits and detriments of being uh, a generalist judge, uh, just like I was actually a generalist appellate lawyer pre previously, uh, is that uh, you get to try something new every day. 
uh, and learn new areas. Um, with that said, there are some areas there are some areas of the law that are relatively straightforward and others uh, much less so. And in particular, what I'm going to focus on is, is, is those areas of the law that really actually don't really feel like law. Um, uh, to give you one one recent example for me is uh, the uh, I forget the name of the statute, but the, it's the IDEA, uh, Individuals with Disabilities Education uh, Rights. Um, those types of disputes typically involve having to get very detailed into uh, scientific disputes and disputes about uh, uh, educational pedagogy, uh, specifically in the context of the mentally disabled. Uh, we're, we're judges and, and Congress has called upon judges to decide those disputes. And of course, we try to rise to the challenge. But I got to tell you, that's not an area of experience for me. And It's not an area of experience for him. So these judges sentence people to life that are uh, a generalist on the issue of criminal law, and they're not a specialist in the expertise area. Let's look at what a generalist judge is defined as. The Federal Circuit and a few other counter examples, notwithstanding American courts, are not substantially specialized. By and large, the American judge is thus a generalist. For better or worse, our judiciary seems to be holding out against the pressures towards specialization that have so marked the contemporary legal and medical professions. Oh, so when a doctor specializes in a certain criteria, even they can use the fact of a practicing practitioner. So they will hold no um, responsibility for the taking of a life during a surgery, a surgical procedure. So the judges are doing the exact same thing. And um, I have been a witness to the medical profession stating that we did all that we can do. And oh, by the way, we have to um, tell you on this hypocritical oath, hypocritical oath, hypocritical oath. I don't know what it's called. Not being sarcastic, although I do in some instances, but in this I'm not. Um, basically, it's saying I hold no responsibility because I am only a practicing physician. So you can practice on a person that I love dearly and you can play Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde on you know, helping this individual when you say that the only ability they have to live is to get this surgery. And then if you botch it up, you tell me, I'm sorry, I was only practicing on your loved one. Wow. What are your views on having a generalist? Look at the case of Robert Sylvester Kelly and deciding the fate built on lies, not listening and having prejudicial actions come forth in even the characteristics of how things are going down in this case. Looking at a pandemic, looking at the fact that he's fighting so difficultly just to find the right attorney, which he's found. But now it looks as though, what? What's your views on that? That's very critical here. So I get really nervous uh, trying to figure out which expert to believe. Uh, and uh, I just, I, I worry that I'm really kind of outside my depth. You know, you give me a statute, you know, I, I could, you know, I'm 20 years on the law, I can, you know, figure it out, or at least I can figure out why it's hard. Uh, and so, you know, there, those areas I, I get. But anytime when you have a dispute that really rests on battles of the experts, uh, I got to tell you that, that I, start to, I start to worry that I'm outside my depth. Uh, Perhaps that's the benefit of being an appellate judge. I think Justice Palmer may have alluded to this is, you know, we basically get to defer to the district court. And so as long as it's a close enough question, then we just kind of bless whatever happened below. Uh, but that, of course, leads it to district courts to have to make those calls in the first instance. And I don't even know how juries handle it because uh, they're literally all obviously having to make the call themselves. So um, anyway, that, that to me, that's where I get the most nervous. Great. Thank you. Um, judge Donnelly. Um, well, we had a little 
chat about this before uh, before this session. And for me, uh, and I think for most of my colleagues on the district court, the hardest thing that I have to do is sentence someone. Um, that is, it can be a, it's it is just very emotional experience for the person being sentenced and for the person's family and for uh, the community uh, in which we live and determining what is an appropriate sentence in a criminal case, um, I find to be just uh, quite difficult. Um, and it, it makes you think about um, the, to what extent incarcerating someone is a solution to the problem. Um, and uh, to what extent you need to protect the community. You think about, as I said before, the um, uh, just the kind of radiating effect that incarceration can have on a family. Um, when 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 a district judge sentences somebody, we very often have letters from family members and friends. And they're very important to me to try to get a picture of the person who's appearing before me. Um, you know, in the, in the district court, the most cases are resolved by plea. And so we don't always have the opportunity to see the person uh, in our courtrooms all that often before the person enters a plea. So um, the input from a person's family and, 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 people that know that person become very important. So that's the difficult, the kind of difficult cases. The other part that's difficult, but also fascinating is that you are, I think other judges have referenced this before, is that we are generalists. And so every day we are seeing something different um, and uh, something new, something that I've, you know, I've never encountered before. I was a prosecutor for 25 years. I did not really encounter patent law very often at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. So um, uh, learning about, uh, about new areas of law um, uh, is something that's extremely challenging and makes for long hours. But it's also, it's, it's why, I think it's why we have judges on our, one judge on our court who's going to be 100 this year, Judge Weinstein. And I think this is what, this is what keeps, uh, you know, this is what keeps us, keeps us going. Uh, so um, I hope I answered that question. I think, I think I did. Wow. A hundred year old judge. Do you think that judge is consistently mentally prepared for the different challenges, even since the pandemic, to be able to make, you know, uh, valuable decisions upon a person's situation in the 21st century? Or do you think that some of his or her ideas may be flawed because of the generation in which they grew up? Should a generalist judge determine the life sentence ability to a defendant if they are not specializing in that law in which they are sentencing? I need to know what your views are about that question. Thank you. Yes, that was great. Thank you very much. Um, Justice Ballmer. Yeah, I'll agree with the, the generalist uh, aspect of the job is great. I, I had a pretty broad practice, pretty broad civil practice uh, as a as a lawyer. Uh, but uh, here we do criminal law and tax law and uh, all sorts of civil cases from real estate to, you know, I uh, you know, had an adverse possession case, the fascinating issue of uh, got into the restatement of, uh, of property and the development of various uh, doctrines of adverse possession of common law. And also, now we're talking about property. We're talking about tax law. We're not talking about human life. We're not talking about generalized judges making sentencing law. Okay, sentencing um, punishments. 
You know, they're stepping over their boundaries, I believe, as a generalist judge. Um, I would rather have a specialist judge definitely determine the fate of an individual whose life is in the trenches um, for having lost life in the criminal within the criminal justice system. Um, wow. And they just admitted it. How does that make you feel? A ton of fun. Um, so it's a little, uh, you know, I, sometimes I sit around with my colleagues and we say, God, people, are, they're actually paying us to do this. They're paying us to figure out this issue that involves a dispute between the governor and the legislature. Uh, how, how lucky can we be? And we feel very lucky. Um, I didn't. As I said, I didn't really didn't practice criminal law. Criminal law, I find, and I'm glad I don't have to do the direct sentencing. Again, this is the, you know, the trial courts do this and we're reviewing it. Did they comply with the statutes? It do, does it comply with uh, any constitutional limitations? Uh, but I think that most difficult cases, uh, sort of factually and they're very complicated legally, are uh, the dependency cases. When can the state uh, intervene in family relations because the parents are either unable or unwilling to take care of their kids. Uh, and when should parental rights be terminated? There are deep, serious constitutional issues there. The facts of these are heartbreaking, even, uh, but uh, they still have to be decided in general, as, uh, as Judge Ho was saying, this is the kind of case where we're going to, often defer to the trial court who has seen the people in this family. They may have seen several different children. They may have seen struggles with addiction uh, or incarceration uh, by the parents. Uh, and we're often going to defer to them. But there are legal standards that we have to ensure are met, statutes and constitutional uh, provisions that have to be complied with, uh, as well as just the, you know, the heartbreak that goes on in, in some of these cases. Uh, I guess the other type of case that I don't like that much that we have to do and uh, that my federal colleagues don't are lawyer discipline cases. We enforce the rules of the Oregon State Bar. Uh, those are, uh, you know, they're, we have de novo review, so we're supposed to really look at the record carefully. Uh, those are sort of tough cases, but in general, uh, uh, we, and we, most courts, uh, and, and certainly our court, we spread the cases around. Everybody does some of everything. We don't have a tax specialist or a real estate specialist who gets all those cases. There's some, the kinds of issues, they're interesting issues to me, you know, uh, causation in torts, uh, damages issues in tort cases, uh, some corporate litigation issues that because I dealt with those sorts of things in private practice, I, uh, I, I think are interesting, uh, but we, we do the gamut and it's, uh, it's always a challenge when you open, here's a giant new set of briefs to read. I don't know anything. It's like reading for this. It's like, uh, you know, the appointments clause, we don't have many appointments clause cases, uh, in the Oregon Supreme Court. Finally, I would like to read a few R. Kelly Appeal TV commenters. Um, comments relating to some really great points that should be considered here. But before I do, I would like to ask, which of the three judges would you have been beneficial that would have been beneficial to the hearing of the R. Kelly case from the beginning? Would um, it have been, should it have been Justice Bonner? Would it have been different if it wasn't Don Lee and was Ho? I mean, how do you feel about that? Which one do you believe would have been a more fair outcome to the processing of the case going through from beginning till now? So let's look at a commenter's statement. Yvette Scott. One day ago said, Ann Donnelly will be unquestionable. This case will ruin her integrity and dignity in regards of administration of civil and constitutional laws. The Court of Appeals statutes on the steps states that common sense and law, one cannot be with the other. God sent Jennifer. Ann may have a temporary hold, but God sent Jennifer, who is overwhelmingly equipped 
Two, fully vindicate R. Kelly. Believe Miss Bonjean is equipped, knowledgeable, and law abiding. Ann Donnelly has tainted judicial system with bias, prejudice, and favors. She further states all the supplemental indictments, sealed document, bad acts, hearsay, and prosecutorial hijacking of the laws unacceptable for any USA citizen. Thank you, Miss Yvette. You are 100% correct. And that is the reason why we love the views and points of our commenters. Thank you. Reginald Williams, two days ago, writes, check everything that they allege to be a law to see if it falls under what's called co co color colorable law. 18 USC 242 deprivation rights. Check anything and everything that has to do with due process of law. Everything is truly about administrative procedure, not so much necessarily what people call the law, but the process by which they arrived at their conclusion. Have every and anybody involved with this case, such as judge, district attorneys, prosecutors, regular lawyers, attorneys, sheriffs, deputies, clerk of court, stenographer, every single individual. Then look up in a particular juris jurisdiction, the bond office, find out where their bonding company is, by which every government official interfacing with the public must carry X amount of liability or what they call indemnity insurance in order to protect the public from being injured by them. Heads up, Kales. Thank you. Thank you for that information. I will be looking it up. Um, M.K. Sandals writes, even though the case is bogus, I think R. Kelly being locked up needed to happen. Kelly's a hard learner. Therefore, he needed a forced two year sit down after the case he beat. Anyone with half a brain cell would have made sure everyone around them had a governmental issued ID and to be extra safe. Definitively not screwing chicks under 25. Thank you, MK Sandals. That makes sense. And I would have definitely done that myself um, and just made sure that the group of individuals that were around me at the time was going to be respectful to what I was dealing with. Um, so you're absolutely right. I mean, I hate to say it, <laughs> you know, and I do believe that the case is definitely bogus. Moving on. No bias. 17 hours ago wrote right now at this very moment, I'm playing an R. Kelly mix I made. I named it R. Kelly, The Life of a Man, Part 1. It's my best mix CD, King of R&B, the best ever. Sunshine Johnson, we love you, Kells. We are all watching God work this problem into power, bringing praise. God, we thank you for all being everything and for Kells' freedom. It's near family. Stay focused, Kells. The real truth is out. We knew it was all bullcrap from day one. And our final comment of the day. Okay, Collect26 two weeks ago wrote, the federal court process has always worked in this fashion. The reason why the federal courts have such a high conviction rate isn't because they win cases. It's because those who they bring charges against are afraid to be found guilty in trial due to the fact that the penalties are harsher than state convictions. Now to my point. In federal court, the government does not have to prove guilt. All they have to prove is likelihood. This is where conspiracy comes in. There are hundreds of thousands of men in federal prison, especially drug offenses, that was not found with any narcotics, guns, money, etc., that are doing time due to the way the federal government tactics are. What they do is find anyone that is willing to take the stand and testify against for the government. And for the most part, these individuals will do it, even lie, to get less time, which means you do not have to be guilty. As long as they have a witness that can place you there, say they saw, or claim that they're that they were victimized by you, the federal government can secure a victory on the basis of conspiracy. 
Anyone will tell you that conspiracy is the hardest charge to beat in any federal court. And those with this knowledge will also tell you that the majority of people will take a plea deal, then go against a charge of conspiracy. Most of R. Kelly's charges fall under these guidelines. Going with the understanding on how they have succeeded in getting a guilty verdict is understanding the above mentioned likelihood. Quote, likelihood, giving the fact that they have witnesses to take the stand and say that he had done these things in question, which, by the way, was overkill. So now the jury is left with determining what is the likelihood, quote, of him committing these acts. This is where the um, Robert Sylvester Kelly comes into play. That series. Oh, this is where the SRK comes into play. That series shed him in a bad light, which caused an emotional uproar and outcry, which, in my opinion, was deliberate. However, the effects worked. How did it work? It made it nearly impossible for him to get a fair trial due to per perception by said docuseries. And given the fact that it was viewed by millions, there was nothing good said about him. No one knew that he gave monies to build a woman's shelter to name a few. It gave a one sided view of him. Regardless if the witnesses were lying, whether or not they were credible, the stage was set. And this is why we have the Court of Appeals. I believe there is a likelihood that he will get off. The tactics of the federal government was disgusting. They have been using these tactics for four decades. The reason why is that they are seldom challenged, but they are going to learn today. And that's what I feel. I thank you so much for liking, commenting, subscribing to the podcast of the R. Kelly Appeal TV. Thank you for sharing and giving me your comments. Um, thank my Zoom classes. Thank you for being so respective to looking at the law from a standpoint where people truly benefit. And again, um, this is a channel. And as always, keep it 100 and we'll see you next time.